Hi, I'm Pete Cater. Welcome to part three of this four-part series on the subject of big band drumming. Time and again, I keep coming back to the importance of two things. They are musicality and simplicity, okay? When you're playing in a big band and you've got to take fills or solos or play with the ensemble, people don't want to hear all your drum chops. What they want is a strong rhythmic continuum that's going to help all those guys blowing trumpets, trombones and saxophones to play their phrases in exactly the right place. What we're going to do this time is we're going to do some kind of typical big band hits and we're going to talk about how we set up the horns. So the first one we're going to do is one of the most commonplace figures you'll see on big band charts from all the eras and that is a hit on the end of one. So we've got one, two, one, two, three, four, one. One, two, three, four, one. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up some time and then I'm just gonna play the hit and then we're gonna look at ways that we can set up the hit. So here we go. One, two, a one, two, three. Okay, there it is. It's a long note on the and of one. Now, if all you do is that, that's kind of helpful, but you're not really helping the other musicians to place their notes as accurately as you possibly could. So let's do a very, very simple setup so everybody can come in really precisely and really confidently on the and of one. So the fills are really simple and what you've got to remember is that fills are timekeeping. Here's a few examples of fills that are a little bit too busy, there's a little bit too much going on here. See if you can see the difference. One, two, one, two. Mm. So if you start putting too many notes in, if the fills get too busy, the horn players are going to lose confidence. They don't want to hear your practice routine. It's not a drum clinic. So let's go back to a more simple approach. And we'll take the tempo up a little bit. One, two, oh, one, two. Let's take another common phrase that you'll see all the time on big band charts, and that's an eighth note later, so we're going to hit on beat two. So one, two, three, four, one. Bam! And notice this time, I'm not going to use the crash symbol. I'll tell you why in a moment. Okay, here we go. One, two, one, two, three. Now, why did I use the crash symbol the first time and not the second time? Well, I'll tell you. 
Very important when the horn players are playing phrases that you match their articulation. If the brass section is going bow with a long note, then <laughs> crash cymbal and snare works really well. If they're going one, two, three, four, one, bow, and it's really staccato, then you should reflect that in the kind of phrasing that you use on the drum set. Okay, we just talked about matching articulation, use of short sounds and long sounds on the drums to best reflect what the horn players are doing. Now, it's very important that you do that with reference to the dynamics as well. If you're phrasing softly with maybe just saxophones or maybe four horns, obviously how you use the sound of the drums, you're gonna need a little bit less power. Not sacrificing the energy or swing, but not so strong with the crash cymbals. Now, we've got a little notation example in the magazine, and it's just a little typical 12 bar, what we call a shout chorus, when the ensemble's playing, and we're gonna look at some of the things that arise in that 12 bars of music, and talk about different ways of interpretation. Here's the notation played just on the snare drum, and I'm gonna play the ride cymbal, keep the beat going, uh, and then we're gonna look at different ways of interpretation and the how and why of it. Okay, here we go. One, two, oh, one, two, three. So that's the rhythmic notation that you can see written down. Now, just played on the snare drum at a fairly consistent dynamic level, all that does is show somebody that you can read a chart, you can read rhythmic notation. There's not really too much going on as far as the interpretation is concerned. Let's go on now and play the first four bars of the example. So again, I'll slow it down. One, two, one, two. What we can do is we can take a written line and substitute some of the snare notes for the bass drum. So here's what I mean. I'll slow it down so you really get to see what's going on. One, two, one, two, three. So instead of just playing everything on the snare, if I start assigning some of the written notes to the bass drum instead, it just gives it more of a musical flavor rather than just sounding like an exercise. Okay, we're gonna look at bars three and four of the 12 bar notation example, where we've got a band figure, and then we've got three beats of fill, and then we hit on the fourth beat of bar four. One, two, three. So we've got da, 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 one, two, three. So rather than just depending on muscle memory, you can actually think about what you're doing while you're playing. So you're actually improvising rather than just playing something that you practiced and memorized. So here we go, really slow. Bars three and four of our 12 bar notation example. One, two, three. It's really important that your fills are clear, articulate, and in time. As I said previously, fills are timekeeping as well. It's very important to get that in mind.